Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we're going to be reading through the latest documents in the Delphi case. Now, if you were just at the live stream that we had recently, which I'll link in the description box for you in case you missed it, we went over a six-page document, which was a motion to transfer. And that was drawn up by Richard Allen, the suspect in this case's new attorneys, William Labrato and Robert Scremen. Now, during that live stream, I was looking for this document, and this is the document that Judge Gall has apparently removed from the docket and sealed is what's being said. And I'm not sure why, because why is there no transparency? Why does she want to hide this document? Because it's saying very similar things to the motion to transfer. But I did want to go through this. It's four pages and 17 points. Then... I'm going to read through the six page motion to transfer in this video as well, because I know that there's some of you out there that really don't like it when I read documents in a live stream and then there's interruptions and I'm chatting to the community. It's very interactive and you might prefer it when I just read through the documents. So that's what we're going to do in this video. If that's something you like, please do like the video and share it. I would recommend using the hashtags Delphi, hashtag Abby and Libby or Libby and Abby, hashtag justice for Abby and Libby or the other way around and grisly true crime. Okay, so here we go with the uninterrupted version of reading through these documents. Thank you so much to Defense Diaries for posting this, because without Defense Diaries and a few other creators finding this document before it was removed from the docket, we would never have known about it. So Defense Diaries said with their post on X, below is the affidavit of Richard Allen's attorney that was attached to the motion for transfer filed this morning. It appears unbelievably that Judge Gall saw fit to seal or remove it from the docket, once again, shielding it from the public. Will she ever learn? Cases must be tried in the sunlight and not in the shadows. And that's coming from attorneys. So if you've never checked out Defense Diaries, I would highly recommend checking them out as they offer legal commentary on all these updates, which is always very, very helpful. So let's start with this affidavit, State of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen, affidavit on 11-19-23. I accompanied attorneys Robert Scremen and William Labrato to the Westville Correctional Facility to meet with Richard Allen. After arrival at the facility, it took approximately an hour to clear security and reach Mr. Allen, which included riding in a shuttle van to an interior wing of the prison. We met with Mr. Allen in a room lined with windows where prison guards could plainly observe the confidential consultation. The door to the room was left ajar and could not be closed as the door's deadbolt was left protruding from the door, preventing it from closing. Prison guards remained posted just outside the door where they could look through the windows. Mr. Allen appeared apprehensive to speak freely with attorneys, Scremen and Labrato. That's his newly appointed attorneys. I also wonder how he's feeling now about his new attorneys speaking the same language as his former attorneys and if he's still going to fight to have his former attorneys reinstated. It appears so, because that's what the hearing on January 18th is about. Richard Allen was brought to the room wearing ankle shackles, handcuffs, and a wide leather belt fitted with metal O-rings. The ankle shackles and handcuffs were both secured to the waist belt by short chains, which restricted Mr. Allen's every move and gave him the appearance of Hannibal Lecter. His hands were cuffed together such that... The back of his hands were together with one palm facing down and one palm facing up. 
Mr. Allen appeared visibly uncomfortable with his arms twisted at the elbows such that the backs of his hands could be secured facing each other in the handcuffs. Mr. Allen remained shackled and chained in this fashion for the entire visit. One of the prison guards who stood outside the door, later identified as Sergeant Randy Jones, displayed a face tattoo of Odin's spear under his right eye and numerous tattoos on his arms, hands and fingers that resembled Nordic and or Odinistic symbols. I later located a Facebook profile for Randy Jones, including a photo of Sergeant Jones with the same face tattoo of Odin's spear and wearing a necklace with Thor's hammer charm, another symbol associated with Odinism. The hammer necklace worn by Sergeant Jones was inscribed with the letters BRSRCR, which is an acronym for Berserker. A Berserker is a type of Nordic battle axe and a term used to describe warriors fighting for Odin. Other photos displayed three interlocking triangles, another symbol associated with Odinism. Research has revealed that Odinism has been linked to white supremacy in the prison system. Symbols and rituals associated with Odinism also appear to be present in crime scene photos taken in the present case. I just want to offer some commentary there quickly, because during the live stream, some people are getting upset saying that Odinists are not white supremacists. I don't think that's the point. The point is that there are white supremacists who are hijacking Odinism. You know, if you see it that way around, it makes more sense. It's not that Odinists are white supremacists. It's that there's white supremacists, especially in the prison systems, is what's being reported, that are hijacking Nordic beliefs and making it their own for their own purposes. Which normally, if you see any gang or group hijack a religion for their own purposes, it normally turns out to be pretty bad, right? A little bit violent. <laughs> so that's why they bring up the white supremacy here. Mr. Allen stated that he was once shot with a taser through a closed and locked prison cell door. Mr. Allen stated that when it was time for him to take a shower or have rec time, the guards would ask him if he wanted a shower or recreation, but they would slowly shake their heads from side to side, indicating that his response should be no, because it was an inconvenience for the guards to assist with these basic amenities. On 12-22-23, I accompanied attorney Scremen and Labrato to Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, where Mr. Allen had recently been moved, and we still don't really know exactly why. The round-trip drive and visit took over 10 hours to complete. Once at the facility, it again took approximately an hour just to get to Mr. Allen. Prison staff indicated that they did not have any type of visitation rooms for the attorneys to use because they were not equipped for such matters, but had fashioned a visitation room in some sort of prep kitchen within the prison housing unit. We were informed by prison staff that there were video cameras recording the visit. We were taken to Mr. Allen, who was secured in a prison cell located within this kitchen area. The cell appeared to be designed as a place to feed a prisoner. The cell had a solid iron door with a small hinged iron flap approximately 8 inches high that opened just far enough to slide a food tray through. This iron flap was left open and it was through the small opening that we were allowed to see Mr. Allen and speak with him. A folding table was set up approximately 6 feet from the cell door with 3 chairs on the far side of the table. We were instructed to sit in the chairs and not to come within 6 feet of the cell door. This setup made it impossible to show Mr. Allen any videos or discuss any of the documents. Mr. Allen confirmed that he had recently spoken with attorney Cara Vanika by telephone concerning the upcoming Supreme Court hearing. Mr. Allen appeared confused about his legal representation and was hesitant to share information about his case with attorneys Scremen and Labrato, suggesting that he was waiting for the result of the January 18th, 2024 oral argument. I've also recently spoke with Mr. Allen's wife, who similarly was hesitant to provide any information until after the hearing. Mr. Allen stated that since arriving at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, he had been kept in solitary confinement, had not had any recreational time, and had not been allowed outside, and that he had no window. Although he had been there nearly two weeks, he believed that he had taken one, perhaps two showers. He appeared disoriented to date or time. Prison officials confirmed that Mr. Allen had not been taken outside for recreational time, claiming it was a safety issue for Suicide Watch. Mr. Allen expressed concern that he was receiving medications. This was the point I was looking for earlier in the live stream. Mr. Allen expressed concern that he was receiving medications and that he was unsure what he was being given or why, and he had not recently seen a physician. He also stated that whatever medication he receives, he does not always get the same type or number or size 
or color of pills. That definitely doesn't sound right. So if you were at the live stream, you know that this document sounds very similar, except for a few points like this point number 17. But now let's go through that motion to transfer for those of you who haven't heard it yet. Before we do that, this is one of the exhibits that was attached to this affidavit. And you can see the tattoos and the necklace that they were referring to. Okay, and now we can go through this motion to transfer State of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen. Now comes the defendant by and through his appointed counsel, Robert C. Scremen and William Librato, and hereby submits this motion to transfer and state as follows. Argument. Richard Allen is currently being held in pretrial detention at the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, a maximum security state prison. After visiting with Mr. Allen at both the Westville Correctional Facility and the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, it is counsel's belief that one, Mr. Allen is not being treated similar to other pretrial detainees being held in county jails, which is where he should be, and two, pretrial incarceration at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility will seriously, if not fatally, impact counsel's ability to effectively represent Mr. Allen due to the distance of travel and visitation conditions. Facts. On November 3rd, 2022, the state of Indiana filed a motion on behalf of the sheriff of Carroll County asking the court to transfer Richard Allen to the custody of the Department of Corrections, claiming that due to this being a high-profile case, the Carroll County Sheriff could not adequately provide Mr. Allen with necessary security or other needs at the Carroll County Jail. Judge Diener, without holding an evidentiary hearing on the merits, granted the state's motion and approved Richard Allen's transfer to the Department of Corrections and then recused himself from the case that same day. Mr. Allen had no opportunity to object to this transfer and no one appeared to consider how this might negatively impact Mr. Allen's defense. On April 5th of 2023, Mr. Allen's former counsel filed an emergency motion to modify a safekeeping order by the way, if you've missed all of these, it's on the playlist. We went through all of this. We've been through this whole process together every step of the way. It's been quite something. So if you remember that emergency motion to modify safekeeping order from April 5th of 2023, they said it was essentially a motion to transfer Mr. Allen to a county jail. They've been asking for this for a long time. And now his new attorneys are asking for the same thing. I have reviewed counsel's motion, and although I lack personal knowledge to vouch for all of the allegations made as Mr. Allen's present counsel, I believe it to be a meritorious motion, and based upon 25 years of practicing law, I agree that Mr. Allen is not being treated similar to other pretrial detainees in county jails, and that his pretrial incarceration at a distant state prison severely impacts counsel's ability to effectively communicate with Mr. Allen and effectively represent him. I would incorporate the legal arguments made by prior counsel and add that Mr. Allen's distance from present counsel and the conditions during visitation negatively impact counsel's ability to effectively represent Mr. Allen. On April 14th of 2023, this court denied prior counsel's motion and Mr. Allen remains in the custody of the Department of Corrections. On April 28th of 2023, this court received a letter written by an inmate at Westville Correctional Facility alleging that Mr. Allen was being abused and mistreated. That letter that Robert P. Baston wrote, there's actually been a few letters. I think there's three in total so far. One of them had been sealed for quite some time, which was also odd, and then later released to the public. On September 18th of 2023, prior counsel filed a motion for a frank hearing in support of their previously filed motion to suppress. Prior counsel included a 136-page memorandum with 126 confidential exhibits. The memorandum and exhibits, among other things, alleged that prison guards at Westville Correctional Facility were allowed to wear patches on their official uniforms supporting Odinism and that crime scene photos suggested a potential connection to Odinism, a Nordic religion and or cult that has been associated both in the prison system and in society in general with white supremacy. Again, to clarify, it would be white supremacists that have hijacked these beliefs rather than people with those existing beliefs being white supremacists. After reviewing crime scene photos and visiting Mr. Allen at the Westville Correctional Facility, present counsel believes that these claims have merit and that pretrial incarceration within the state prison system negatively impacts Mr. Allen's rights, in addition to counsel's ability to effectively represent him. Can you believe that his new attorneys 
we thought they were friends with Judge Gold, you know, with the Facebook connections and, you know, the things they said on national TV, <laughs> which would be inappropriate. We were like, uh, who are these two guys? But damn, they're saying the same things as the former attorneys, which is pretty scary. On October 27th of 2023, this court appointed attorneys Robert C. Scremen and William Labrato to represent Richard Allen. Attorneys Scremen and Labrato both reside and maintain primary offices in Fort Wayne, Allen County, Indiana. Fort Wayne is approximately 106 miles from Westville Correctional Facility and a two-hour drive. Fort Wayne is approximately 233 miles from Wabash Correctional Facility and approximately a three-and-a-half-hour drive without stops. Council's most recent visit to Mr. Allen at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility was a 10-hour day. And this is not the only client they have. Probably the most high-profile client, but a whole day trip just to see a client? It's too far. Why did they put him there? We still don't know exactly why Richard Allen was moved. On November 19th of 2023, council visited with Mr. Allen at Westville Correctional Facility. The visit was an arduous process which included lengthy travel, complicated and protracted prison security procedures, and difficult visitation conditions. Throughout our legal consultation, Mr. Allen remained uncomfortably and unnecessarily shackled and chained in a manner resembling Hannibal Lecter, while guards watched through glass panels and the door ajar. Mr. Allen clearly appeared intimidated by the guards and was hesitant to speak freely with counsel. See Exhibit 1 Affidavit Investigator S. Muller. That's the one we read just before this. Although none of the prison guards were wearing patches in support of Odinism, one of the guards did have a symbolic face tattoo of Odin's spear and multiple hand and finger tattoos emblematic of Odinism and or Norse mythology, which we looked at just before I read this document, right? The same prison guard had a public Facebook account that also displayed the same tattoos in addition to a necklace with Thor's hammer inscribed with the letters BRSRCR, an acronym for Berserker, which is a very specific type of Norse battle axe and the name given to warriors fighting in honor of Odin. Other photos displayed three interlocking triangles, another symbol associated with Odinism. Mr. Allen stated that Westville guards were intimidating and reluctant to provide him with shower and recreational access because it caused them extra work, and as a result, he often simply remained in his cell and went without recreational time or a shower to keep the peace. On 12 22 Council visited Mr. Allen at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, where Mr. Allen had recently been moved without consulting Council. The round-trip drive and visit took over 10 hours to complete. Access to the prison once again took nearly an hour, and several gates had to be manually cranked open as there was a power outage in a portion of the prison and doors could not be opened. Prison staff indicated that they did not have any type of visitation rooms for council to use because they were not equipped for such matters, but had fashioned a visitation room in some sort of prep kitchen within the prison housing unit. Council was informed that the visitation would be monitored by video camera. Counsel was taken to Mr. Allen, who was locked in a prison cell located within the kitchen. The cell appeared to be designed as a place to feed a prisoner. The cell had a solid iron door with a small hinged iron flap approximately 8 inches high that opened just far enough to slide a food tray through. This iron flap was left open and it was through the small opening that we were allowed to see Mr. Allen and speak with him. A folding table was set up approximately six feet from the cell door with three chairs on the far side of the table. We were instructed to sit in the chairs and not to approach Mr. Allen or come within six feet of the cell door. It's a little weird. This arrangement made it impossible to show Mr. Allen any videos or documents or to discuss the case with him without raising our voices and almost shouting. In 25 years of practicing law in five states, including representing numerous defendants charged with murder, I've never had to conduct an in-custody legal consultation in this fashion. The prison's visitation arrangement created an environment wherein effectively representing Mr. Allen was a fiction. Mr. Allen stated that in the two weeks that he had been at the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, he had not received or even been offered any recreational time, and he believed that he had taken one, possibly two showers, and he had not been allowed outside in the prison yard, although other inmates enjoyed outdoor recreation. Conclusion in 25 years of practicing law, I've never had to conduct an in-custody legal visit in the manner that I have with Mr. Allen. I routinely conduct legal visits within the jails in Allen, Adams, Huntington, Randolph, and Wells counties, including consultations with numerous clients charged with murder. There is never a guard present 
during the consultation and there's never audio or video equipment recording the visit. What are they doing with all these recordings? They did it before. It's the other prison too, with like a handheld camera or something. Uh, these are clearly state prison policies and not county jail policies. I'm often able to sit at a table with my client and have a conversation, but at the very least, I'm able to sit directly across from my client and speak through a large plexiglass partition where we can view videos and documents. County jails routinely, dare I say daily, have lawyers visiting pretrial detainees, and as such, county jails have rooms specifically designed for attorney visits. County jails also have a streamlined access protocol for defense attorneys that often takes no more than a minute or two as opposed to an hour, and laptops, phones, and tablets are routinely allowed during attorney visits with no special requests. County jail visits with clients can even be set up the same day. Clients in county jails are extremely accessible and multiple visits can be quickly and efficiently made when legal issues arise. Based upon counsel's observations and experience, Mr. Allen is not being treated similar to other pretrial detainees held in county jails. However, even if this court were to find that Mr. Allen's pretrial treatment within the state prison system does not in itself justify moving him to a county jail, evidence is absolutely overwhelming that pretrial detainment at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility will seriously, if not fatally, impact counsel's ability to effectively represent Mr. Allen due to the sheer distance of travel and the unworkable visitation conditions. Counsel for Mr. Allen respectfully requests that he be transferred to either the Allen County Jail or the Adams County Jail. We've heard those suggestions before from his former attorneys. They also added there, I think, the Cass County Jail. Now, while you are here, this is one of the updates that we went over in the live stream that I was referring to, where special judge overseeing the Delphi murders case elected Allen County Chief Judge, which initially felt like, wait, is this a promotion? Because that would be odd, <laughs> given everything that's happened. If you don't know what's happened, go to the playlist. We've gone over everything there. You'll see it on the thumbnails and in the titles, exactly what was being discussed. But apparently, this is a rotational thing. It's an admin position. It's not necessarily a promotion and it happens apparently every two years. So that's not such a big deal. Then to just quickly recap what we're waiting for is on Thursday, January 18th of 2024, the high profile murder case in Carroll County will take a detour to Indianapolis and the Indiana State Capitol when the Indiana Supreme Court will intervene in the case. Allen, Richard Allen, is asking the Supreme Court to reinstate his original defense team which was disqualified by Gall for alleged negligence. He also wants the Supreme Court to replace the judge. He claims that she cannot be impartial and has overstepped her judicial authority and to order a new trial date within 70 days to ensure his right to a speedy trial. Even before his trial begins, which is set for October of 2024, the Supreme Court agreed to accept Allen's unusual appeal and will hear oral arguments from attorneys representing Allen and Gall on the morning of January 18th. However, attorney Cara Vanica does not believe that Allen will be in attendance. Apparently, it's not protocol to have the defendant present at a hearing like this at the Supreme Court of Indiana. That's what locals told us in chat. So Cara said, from our position as it stands right now, Mr. Allen will not be attending the hearing and we will not be asking him to attend the hearing. My understanding from Supreme Court services is that the court will not be on its own entering an order to transport him either. I suppose the state of Indiana, through the Attorney General or through Mr. Goodfine, could file a motion asking him, uh, asking to have him transported, but I don't see why the state would want him there. So he's probably not going to be present at that hearing, but that hearing is going to be a big deal in this case. I'm not sure, as we none of us are sure what the outcome will be, but... We're going to be watching it live, so make sure that you are subscribed, put your notifications on, you don't want to miss out on that. There's actually a lot happening in this upcoming week now in January, between January 15th and 20th. That's a very busy week in true crime. So if you don't want to miss out on those things, it could be updates in the Long Island serial killer case with Rex Hureman, Sarah Boone's going to be in court again, Richard Allen's going to have his hearing all sorts of things. Also, if you haven't checked out my community tab or my YouTube shorts, then maybe you missed that Jessica Kurshevsky recently had a hearing that was on January 12th, and she is going to be sentenced on April 5th of 2024. 
always lots of things going on. As we know, true crime does not sleep and we are following all these cases as closely as we can. So depending on which case you're following with us, maybe you're following all of them. Either way, I look forward to seeing your comments in the comment section below, or I look forward to seeing you in the next live chat. If you want to support the work that I do, I would recommend checking out Patreon. It's only a dollar to sign up, but yet it's a great source of support and you get lots of extra perks that only 1% of my audience knows about. So go and check it out. There's also a post that on, on there for everyone. You don't have to be a patron to see them. So you could just see how it is and you get a preview of what's on there in case you are interested. Okay, so I'm glad that Defense Diaries posted that affidavit. Otherwise, we might have never seen it. Let me know if you think it should be hidden. Why do you think that Judge Gall wanted that document to be sealed? I mean, I believe it is. Already it's off. I checked the court docket. It's not on there. So it's already been taken off there. And they're pretending like it doesn't exist. Why is that? Leave your comments below and I will see you in the next one. Stay safe.